Hello and welcome back, I'm EVM. Now, if you're new to EVs or you're thinking about getting one, you might look at the charging in terms of the speeds and why there are different speeds and why you have two different types of charging or more and think, ah, this is just a bit of a mess. So that's essentially what this video is hoping to do, to simplify charging. So if you are looking into an EV, uh, it will be easy. And it is easy, to be honest. It's not as familiar with petrol or diesel cars but it isn't complicated, it really is pretty straightforward. And that's hopefully what I'm gonna do in this video. You have to excuse me if I sound a little bit more coarse as usual. I've uh, got a bit of man flu and uh, well, please pray for me that I pull through this. Once you've done that praying though, please do say a big thank you to the channel sponsor, which is smarthomecharge.co.uk. Without them, this video wouldn't exist. So please do visit them, especially if you are looking to get an EV. If you want an electric car charger for your house, put your car that you're getting or you've got into there and it will spew out a load of home chargers that will be perfect for you. They do charge cables, they do lots of news and uh, reports and just interesting stuff about electric vehicles in general. It's not just selling you something. So it's a great resource for EVs in general. There is also a tasty referral in the description below. I'll put it as a pinned comment as well, which essentially means that you can get some nice credit for your electric juice, or as it's now called, electric universe card by Octopus. So you can use it out there on a lot of the public charging networks. All the referral is yours, I get nothing from this. So knock yourself out and do some well, free public charging. Okay, now let's get on with this. On the whiteboard of truth, it's back. Uh, starting with why you have two different types of charging for an EV. Well, you've got AC charging and DC charging. I'm not gonna go down the technical route on this. So if you are technically minded, don't poke any holes in things. I'm just trying to simplify it to make things nice and easy. Think of AC as the slower type of charging, the sort of charging you would do at home or maybe supermarkets, anywhere you're gonna spend typically an hour or two or three or four or five or the whole day at. So it might look like this at a supermarket, it will be a post type charger and you would typically use your own cable. With DC charging or rapid charging as it's often referred to, that essentially is the sort of charger that will look like this, very big, it will always be a tethered charger so you would use the cable that is attached to that because they're very thick, there's a lot of power going through that and you would never use your own cable for it. So think of this as slow charging, think of this as fast charging or rapid as I will call it from now on. Bear with me, if you're wondering why you would want slower charging, well, you've got to get out of this mindset in terms of with petrol or diesel, you would get empty and then fill it up. That's just how we've done it for many, many years and that's, you know, it's familiar. Whereas with charging, you don't have to be stood next to your car when it's refueling. So if the car's gonna be sat there at home, for example, for, well, 12 hours overnight, you know, you get home from work and then it won't be used until the next day, it doesn't need to charge very fast. Slow, slow is fine. And slow is typically a lot cheaper in terms of how much the chargers cost. So I would rather have 20 slow chargers in a car park than one rapid charger, especially if it's something like a works car park where the car sat there for eight hours, you might as well have it charging, even at a slow rate, it will be enough. So that's the first kind of culture change that you need to get used to with an EV. Don't just think, well, it takes me five minutes in, an e in a petrol car and everything else is rubbish. That's good if you stood next to it. That's good if you're doing a long journey and want to refuel quicker. So sometimes it is genuinely less convenient with an EV, but overall, I think the pros outweigh the cons, mainly if you can charge at home, if I'm honest. Now, AC charging. This is a car I'm gonna use as a specific example. And the manufacturer will say, well, you can charge up to 11 kilowatts on AC and 135 on DC. So let's imagine that's the car you're looking at. That's what the dealer or the brochure or the website has said that the car can do. This charging site here is, a, is actually a genuinely real one it's from uh, uh, it's Morrison's in Clapton. I did a video about it several months back. And I picked that because it's pretty much got every charger you're going to come across. It's quite unusual. Mostly you will only have one speed of charger, but I thought this would highlight the example quite nicely. So let's imagine you take this car to this charging site. 
So if you plug the 11 kilowatt charging car into a seven kilowatt post, then you will only get seven into the car. Because even though the car's capable of taking more, the charger isn't capable of giving more. And if you plug that 11 kilowatt car into the 22 post, Again, it would only charge at 11 because that's the most the car can take in. So whatever the lowest speed of either the charger or the car is, that's the maximum that the car will charge at. It's pretty straightforward. And the same is for DC. This car can charge at 135 or up to 135. So plugging it into a 300 kilowatt charger isn't going to make it any faster because the car can only go to 135. And again, if you plug it into the 75 kilowatt charger, you would only max out at 75 because even though the car's capable of taking more, the charger cannot give you it any quicker. So that's why sometimes you plug into uh, mainly rapid chargers and you don't get the speed or anywhere near the speed that the car says it can get. There are many variables that can affect the speed of charge of the car. Temperature of your batteries, for example, sometimes the chargers are restricted because there are lots of people charging at that site at the same time. But ultimately, whatever the manufacturer states that the car can do, that's the maximum, not what you will always get. Again, I will explain that more later on in the video in terms of the charge curve and a bit of charging etiquette as well. When I say charging etiquette, I mean, just like you wouldn't go to a petrol station, fill up at the petrol pump and then leave the car there whilst you walk over to the supermarket and complete your weekly shop. You would, because of the uh, refueling etiquette, whatever you want to call it, move that car from the pump to the car park next door and then do your shop or whatever it is you're doing. Because it would be selfish to leave your car at the petrol pump blocking it for everyone else. So let me talk about the charging equivalent of that. Let's imagine you've got this car and you're going to this charge site and all of the chargers are available. So yours can do up to 135. The best charger you could use is the 150 kilowatt charger because you would be able to max out what your car can do, but you're not wasting the charger's speed. By which I mean, if you use the 300 kilowatt charger, you'd still only get 135. So if someone then comes at the same time to use it and thinks, well, I can get up to 300 kilowatts. I have a, I know, an Ionic 5, for example. They're gonna have to use the slower charger. So you, you're reducing the throughput of the charging site. So it helps everybody if you pick the charger that matches your car the best. You don't want to turn up at a charging site and find there's a big queue because people are using the wrong charger and it's just slowing everything down. Don't get me wrong, if you arrive at this site and the only one available is a 300 kilowatt charger, use that charger. I'm not expecting someone to wait until the perfect charger is available, use the one that is there if that's all that's left. But ultimately it helps everybody if we're all well, courteous to everyone else. Destination charging is slightly different. It's designed for the car to be there for many hours, like a, like a park and ride, for example. And that's why they're typically slower charging because you can have many of them and you're not likely to come back to your car for several hours. Rapid charging is almost certainly charging only parking bays. So if you're not charging, you shouldn't be there. If your car's finished charging, you move just like a petrol station. If you've finished putting fuel in your car, you move the car. They're charging bays, not electric car parking bays. I see this quite a lot, where someone gets an electric car and thinks that the parking bays are for them, even though they're not charging. All that does is block the charger for someone who needs it, and again, increases queues, reduces the throughput of the chargers, and ultimately, it will happen to you. If you say, I don't care, I'll park where I want, and you know who you are, well, the next time you turn up to a charger and it's full or there's a queue, something like that, it's probably because someone's doing that very thing, being selfish. Now, let me wipe all this out and I'll show you the charging curve and ultimately why, as part of all this etiquette thing, that once you get past 85, 90%-ish, it varies between cars, you should then leave the charging bay. You don't want to go to 100% when you're charging on most public DC certainly, charging networks. It slows you down, it slows everyone else down, and again, reduces the throughput. Right, here we are. Here's the uh, graph that I've badly drawn out. Please don't look into it too technically, but it gives, again, a good example of what I'm trying to get across. And that's that this is the state of charge of the battery. So 
not percent, 100 percent. And this is how fast the charger is putting energy into that car based on everything being, you know, really good. So the, the temperature of the battery is up to spec. Everything is optimum. I've got this charging curve from a uh, charging network. So it will vary between various cars. They have slightly different charging curves uh, depending on what car we're talking about. But ultimately, they all do pretty much the same thing. So you may notice that the higher the state of charge of the battery, so if you're at 50%, if you're at 100%, the higher state of charge of battery, the slower the charge goes into the car. That's predominantly to protect the battery. So in this particular case, you plug the car in at 10%. So you're on 10%, you plug your car in, everything's great, the temperatures are good, and you're on a very fast charger. You've got a car that can charge at, well, in this case, nearly 200 kilowatts. So for the first portion, so almost up to half of the battery's capacity, you get in full whack, you get in the fastest charging speeds. So up to about 45, 50%, you will get pretty much close to what the manufacturer states the car is capable of, assuming again that the temperature of your batteries and so forth are uh, where they need to be. Once you get above kind of the 45, 50% mark on the car, then the speed drops off to the point where you get above 75% and we've gone from nearly 200 kilowatts to around 70 odd, in this particular example anyway. You would be quicker and this is saving you time, not just everyone else, charging twice from 10 to 50, 60%, than charging from 10 to 100%. Now, if I go back to when I had my first Nissan Leaf, it used to take roughly half an hour to get from 10% to 80%, but it then take almost as long to go from 80% to 98. So you think, well, I can add 60, 70% in half an hour, why would I spend the same amount of time getting an extra 10, 15%? Again, you would be better on a long, long journey charging twice for shorter periods at the optimum speed than you would be charging just once all the way to the top. When this is at 90%, you're probably looking at 40 odd kilowatts getting into the car and it's starting to peak at nearly 200 in the first portion, so it's nearly a quarter of the speed because it's so, so near the top as it were. So again, back to that charging etiquette. Once you get past that, let's say 85, 90%, unplug your car and move it somewhere else if you're still staying there or just carry on your journey. There are times when you can override this, of course. I sometimes charge up to about 95% if I'm going to parts of Scotland because I don't trust certain chargers. There might only be one charger between me and my destination. I don't trust it, so I want as much as possible from the one I am at. There are times when that does happen. So when I am charging above what would be normal, shall we say, I stay with the car once it gets kind of above 70 odd percent. Because then if anybody does turn up and thinks, what's this Muppet doing? Charging at 93% still, I can explain to them what I'm doing. So again, it's just informing people but ultimately we're trying to increase the throughput of charging at each charging site. The quicker a car gets in and out again, the more people can charge, the less queues they'll be, and we all win. And remember, again, it's different to a petrol or diesel car. I've spoken to, again, many people at service areas where they need 40% to get home, shall we say, and they charge at home. So why would you charge to 70, 80% when you only need 40, 50 to get to your charger at home? You're wasting your own time. Sometimes it will be slower with an electric car, absolutely. Sometimes it's actually quicker. I waste less time refueling my electric car because I can charge at home anyway, than I would do with a petrol car. Because all I do is I get home, I plug it in, and then I'm done. The car is charging when I'm sleeping or eating or doing whatever. Whereas with a petrol engine car or diesel, you have to go to a petrol station, you have to fill it up. It only takes you five, 10 minutes, but you have to go there. So you want to go there as little as possible. Let's face it, they're not nice places to go out at petrol stations. At least when you're charging, you don't have to stand next to your car. You can get on with other stuff. If you're at work, you're working whilst it's charging. So it doesn't really matter how fast that car takes to fill up, it's saving you time because you're not stood next to it when you're doing a long journey, as I said earlier, then yes, you do lose time. So you win some, you lose some. 
I always think of an EV as like a mobile phone. Imagine you had the choice of two phones in your hand. One that could last a week on its battery and one that could last a day. Which one would you choose? Well, you'd choose the one that lasts a week, clearly, because it lasts a week. But what if I told you that the phone that lasts a week, you had to charge at the phone shop, whereas the one that lasts a day, you could charge at home. Which would you choose? Now, of course, if you can't charge at home, that analogy doesn't help you at all. And, well, you probably would say that's very inconvenient having to always use public charging. I would be the first to admit, we're not ready yet for mass EV adoption for people who cannot charge at home. But over half of the people, over the half of the households in the UK can charge at home, roughly speaking. So there's still a lot of people out there that, well, think it's as bad, you know, it's worse than it is. Remember, EVs are still relatively immature technology. And there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, the rubbish. That's like looking at an iPhone 1 and going, yeah, these smartphones are never going to kick off, are they? They're, they're rubbish. They've got to have time to mature, to get better, to get faster, to get cheaper. So we're not there yet, but for some people, we are. If you don't like an EV, then, well, why are you watching an electric car channel, for one? But ultimately, just don't buy one yet. Okay, thank you for watching. Thank you to smarthomecharge.co.uk for sponsoring this video. If you found it helpful, it's because of them predominantly, and, and me of course. But no, thanks for watching, uh, see you soon, and please do subscribe. Please click the join button, apart from an iOS device, which doesn't work on that for some reason. If you want to become a member of the channel for 99p a month, bargain, you get early videos, you will get some unique videos, and hopefully at the start of the new year, live streaming just for members only, to ask any questions you want to me directly. So there we go, thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.